Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actor Richard Horvitz and author Emily Rapp. Native California actor Richard Horvitz was raised in Los Angeles, and he's been entertaining audience for the last 30 years. He was working at the age of 10 when he made a major splash in commercials, big commercials. He was on stage in Oliver with Dick Sean and Stubby K. And by the time he got to UCLA, Richard, I think this is great. It only took you one quarter's <laughs> worth of work to learn everything, right? Yes, I learned everything they had to offer in, in one quarter. <laughs> Why did you stay at UCLA? I was majoring in theater arts. And uh, at the time, I was still auditioning. I was still a working actor. And uh, I landed a part on a series called Safe at Home that uh, ran for 103 episodes. So little did I know that it was going to uh, become a full-time series, and it did. <laughs> and as a result, I ended up leaving college to go and pursue my dream. But on the one hand, I figured <laughs> if I'm going to be an actor when I finish my degree, I'm still an actor. And I don't know that there are a lot of people that go, OK, we're going to give you the part because you have a theater arts degree. No, but we like it when you've studied it, don't we? Yes. Did, I, you, did you go back and teach? I, I went back. You know, funny thing is, is I actually went back and taught uh, an extended learning course at, at the California State University, Northridge. Oh, you did? That that's was in voiceover, but that's acting. But voiceover is another thing that you do. I'm going to get to that. So you started with summer. Uh, uh, Safe at home. What was Safe it? Safe at home. Safe, was, at, home, safe right. at home. And then you you started well, during, doing a lot of t a series. Yes, uh, I I did a lot of guest stars on shows like Head of the Class. As a as a younger child, I was on Different Strokes. Um, I did Head of the Class. Um, you can't take it with you. Baby well, Boom. All during the eighties, I guess. Yes, huh? during was the eighties. Was all TV for you? TV until around nineteen eighty six, when I did a film called Summer School with uh, Mark Harmon and Kirstie Alley for Paramount, directed oh. by Carl Reiner. Oh, that must have been fun. It was a wonderful experience. How was Carl Reiner? Uh, I would have to say that Carl is one of the nicest men I've ever met in my life. Uh, one a wonderful man to work for. Was he in the film as well? He was. He did a cameo <laughs> in the film. And how did he direct? You know, it was really great. If we were improvising off the set and we're just playing and having fun, Carl would watch us and go, hey, let's shoot that. And we'd spend a whole day shooting oh, that. And so that really worked. Yes, and, and he's a great director. He's an actor, so he is very good with actors. Well, you were able to take direction, I guess, because you'd done so much TV. And, and, and uh, commercials, do you have to take a lot of direction? Yeah, oh, yes, because you have a short amount of time to get a lot of information across in 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Um, I started out as a hand model. I know. That's what you said. I couldn't believe it. Yes. But what would a hand model boy hand model be doing? Um, a boy. <laughs> my very first commercial was this thing called Kent and His Cosmic Cruiser. And it was, a, it was during the time of Star Wars. So they, there were all these kind of rip-off toys of, of, of the Star Wars. Oh, oh the, the, um, right. And so I was hired to play the hands of the kids playing with oh, the in the close up they zoom in on they the zoom hands. in on my hands and say and it says not actual size but they weren't talking <laughs> about my hands they were talking about the toy oh that's really funny yes so then um, but then i didn't want to be known as just another pretty hand <laughs> So, so what'd you do? So I decided, yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to be appreciated for my whole body. But you did like Chevy commercials. And Chevy Citation, Freshen Up Bubblegum. I was in a, in a, there was a whole series of commercials for Freshen Up where I said, there's liquid inside this gum. And, and how did you look? Like the little, like this, there's liquid guy. inside this gum. <laughs> but when you were talking about. Although really in, in true life, I was probably going like this. Oh, there's liquid inside this gum. Do they still make that gum? I, I certainly hope not, because I just offended the product. They did, but they're not paying me anymore, so. <laughs> I was just going to say, when you were talking about uh, uh, s stars and you wanted to be a star known for your whole body, you actually 
are a comedian, which I didn't realize. I yes. mean, I knew you were I, an actor. I don't know if the audience realized it either, but I hope they did. <laughs> but, but stars, you were on stars. The uh, stars comedy promo, yes. Yeah. Um, very recently, last year, I worked I work a lot with Fred Willard. Um, Those are so funny. You yes. act like you're like the geeky guy who comes in, and he's like the straight guy? Um, geeky. Hmm. Define geeky. Cause, I Not mean, good? That's kind of a contrast to my... <laughs> my Tom Cruise, Bruce Springsteen Oh, excuse look. me. Did so. you go in like that? Did Fred let you come in like Tom Cruise? Yeah, I actually, Fred was actually the guy who was uh, kind of the oblivious boss, and I was a programmer in the spots. So it was kind of a takeoff on the, on the show working. It was kind of a working environment. But then I saw that you were on Jimmy Kimmel yes. with him, and yes. that's, maybe that's where I thought you were the geeky guy. Uh, the, first, the first spot I did with Fred uh, on Jimmy Kimmel, we did a sketch in which... Um, I was Fred Willard's biggest fan. Oh, that's and then I come in <laughs> and I'm wearing the tuxedo he wore in uh, Best in Show and Oh, those kind of things. Yes. Yeah. And then the other one was Fred was the was the co host. I was the co host's co host in the other sketch we did. Oh, you were the I was co-host. Kind of his Ed McMahon. <laughs> and you did Saturday Night Live. Yes, I did it I did it. We did a um, with the same group, uh, my friend T. Sean Shannon, who wrote for Saturday Night oh. Live, wrote a series of uh, short films called uh, Bear City, and I played a bear. Oh, so that wasn't funny? It was very that funny. Was very, funny. <laughs> very funny, yes. <laughs> Guy in a bear suit, come on. <laughs> so we're bears getting... are always funny. <laughs> so we're getting I'm from... not sure a rabbit, then bears aren't so funny. Were you a rabbit ever? Or a salmon. Not salmon a don't salmon. find bears very no, funny, no. no. Were you... Um, <laughs> really plugging away at your TV career or did you think you should um, do film? You know, I I didn't really have a, I don't know if this is a good or bad thing, I didn't really have any clear direction of where I was going. I just kind of went out on whatever things they were were auditioning. I started out in, in theater, really, as a child. I did musical theater. I did um, Oliver at the Aquarius Theater. But with, were you singing and dancing? Yes. Were you trained like that? Yes, I was trained as a tap dancer. But who sent you out? Did your mother want you to be uh, an actor? You know, my mom didn't really want me to be an actor, mainly because she didn't want to be going out, driving me all over oh, Hollywood, I mean, yeah. and taking me out of school, etc. And then one day, this man by the name of Floyd Huddleston, uh, a wonderful songwriter, he wrote uh, the music for the Aristocats for Disney. Oh, yeah. He had written a, a, a musical that uh, he wanted to put on at the church I was attending as a, as a kid. And he wanted me to play this part. And he was just really a nice guy, liked me a lot, and said to my mom, he has to meet my agent. And that's how it happened. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, I would like to say I was sitting in Schwab's uh, uh, <laughs> drugstore in a nice tight sweater, but that really wasn't. No, and Schwab's is gone. Yes, I know. I know. I know. So you had to find some other place. I had place. to find the other some hall. place to be discovered, yes. <laughs> the church yeah, hall. Yeah, I just hung out at church halls. I figured you'd need a nice crowd. But your mother wasn't pushing you, and yet no, you made never. all this. Yeah. You, you really made it as I, a child actor. I knew from the time I was about five years old that I liked to perform. I used to watch um, Flip Wilson and uh, oh. Tom Jones from England, and loved those shows, I loved entertaining, and I used to imitate them. I started out doing a lot of imitations as a kid. I was gonna, I was gonna say that because when you do your voiceovers, you yes. have to use different kind of voices. Is there any um, show business in your family? Yes, my brother is a director. He's a musical oh, yeah. variety director. He directs the uh, Oscars and oh, the Emmys oh. and... Uh, Does he write music? Uh, you know, he's written his own music, but nothing uh, ever published. But mo mostly directing? Just directing, yeah. He's and what's his name? Louis J. Horvitz. Oh, so we have it in the family. Did your mother yes. push him? No, he pushed himself. He, he was, pushed himself, none, none too. Of us, I had an uncle and an aunt who were magicians oh, that's in that's Michigan. Yeah. but No fair, no fair. So you That might have led to a life in the circus. I don't know. but I, Well, you I could do that if I you're could. a song and dance man. I am a song and dance man. And so you were doing this song and dance at the Whitefire Theater recently. Oh, very recently. I was doing a play called uh, Tiptoes, which was a revival of a Gershwin musical that hadn't been done since... I think it was 1920. It was a 20 20s, sometime, yeah. Sometime. And it was it was a very successful run. Did you tap? I t in the in the show I didn't tap. It was funny because uh, it was the first time I played an older character in, in the in the musical. I played Uncle Hen. Oh, you didn't and have to. My niece is is uh, Tiptoes. She's the ballerina in the group, and we're actually a vaudeville team. My my partner, uh, played by Kyle Nudo. Um, 
we, um, his name is Al, I'm Uncle Hen. Did he dance? He danced. He oh, sang so you too. were telling him what to do? So we were a vaudeville team, and you got to see our vaudeville act, which is... You were, uh, you've been in a lot of theaters. You've been in the Geffen Theater. The Geffen Theater. But, but basically drama, right? Um, the Geffen was also a musical. It was funny, I was went it? on a musical run. I started out in musical theater, and uh, uh. I, I didn't really pursue it um, as, you know, having grown up in Los Angeles, California, it was mostly about television and film. And uh, as I got older, I got to the age where I probably would have gone to New York and pursued, wondered, it, yeah. pursued the theater more. But because I started doing that series, Safe at Home, um, I was locked up in that for three years, and at the same time, I did summer school, and from there, I went on to do. But other you were TV still shows. going to school. You were going to school in Van Nuys, uh, or no? I, well, as a child actor, I was. I went to school on the sets. Oh, you and, did. And I still went to school in to to Grant High School in the oh, you in Van Nuys and yeah. Madison Junior High. Oh, you did all of that. Okay, yes. so we got you on the stage. Yes. We have you singing and dancing. We have me singing and dancing. But there's another play that you have been reading or doing readings called Push. Ah, uh, yes. Written by Kristen Lazarian. Yes, and um, some might think there is nepotism in this business. I will. I will. Uh, <laughs> will you attest that. to that? I will attest to the fact that there is. It was written by my wife Kristen, who is a wonderful playwright. And it's an award-winning play. It's an award-winning play. It's it uh, it won something. Uh, it won. It swept this festival called the Fritz Blitz Festival in San Diego, and it swept every category: best writing, best ensemble, best. Oh, ensemble. Yeah, because I wasn't in is. that. I wasn't in that version though. <laughs> but tell us a little bit about that play um, well it's interesting it's about a wife who who uh, questions her husband's fidelity uh, mainly because her own father she discovers uh, recently uh, had a may or may not have had a, uh, a girlfriend on the side so that's what touches it off in yes, the play that's, that's what, what she's thinking I see. And what she does is she ends up uh, hiring a uh, what's called a uh, Operative. An, an operative. Very <laughs> an operative. good. You saw I the love play. that. An operative, which is actually a decoy. He was sent out to <laughs> try to hit on the husband to see if he will take the bait, and then she reports back to the wife and says, Your husband is unfaithful. So, how did Kristen get this idea? I have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. It's, it came completely out of the blue. I don't know. I, I think we were watching a show at one point, and uh, there was something about these decoys, and it kind of oh. got her to thinking. Of course, in the play, I didn't play the husband. I played the friend of the husband. Oh, I don't think she'd want you playing the husband. No, she didn't want to see no. me have simulated sex on stage with <laughs> exactly. uh, another person. But I'm sure that... Although she hired a decoy <laughs> actress to audition me to see if I would go for it. So it was, oh, you're just kidding. Yes, see, kidding. that's the com comedian coming out. And we'll go to cartoon talking about decoys. Yes. The cartoon and the voiceovers, because you said you do a lot of things. You have, yes. uh, what, Ben 10, Squirrel um, Boy. Yeah, my most, I think the ones that people know me most from is I do the voice of a character called Invader Zim on Nickelodeon. And um, what does he sound like? I am Zim! Tell me, girl, why was there bacon in the soap? I'm an alien. So, it's so like, how do you, so do you watch the screen and then no. do it? How do you do no, it? No, um, that's dubbing, you know, in, in a lot of anime ah, shows that are from Japan, you dub those. But I, I do original animation, domestic animation. And basically we get a script like any other acting job. We read the script and we record with the other actors and then they animate from what we do. Oh, they animate after. Yeah. Oh, you do it first, so you're all sitting around like a reading, more or exactly. less. Exactly, uh, around microphones. Does and someone direct you? It's like a play. It, it's called. It's. They refer to it as um, oh. radio style recording. Oh, I see. So it's a totally different way than what yeah. we think voiceover is. Like you're watching a screen and then saying what exactly. they're saying. When it allows you, it allows you to uh, improvise more, and then the artist sketch some things you do. And and you're you're developing little man Dan. And oh what? yes, and his uh, big little man, fat little man Dan and his big fat hand. We actually are in storyboard hand. hand. It's about a, a a boy who is born with a very large hand, and the hand is live action. And the hand itself is a character. It's almost like the bane of Dan's existence because his hand is more popular than he is. So we went all the way full circle. The hands. I like that. <laughs> I didn't realize the that. hand model, and now big fat hand. Now big fat hand. So thanks a lot, Richard. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for watching this part of the show. We'll be right back with author Emily Rapp.
Author Emily Rapp was born in Nebraska and grew up in Wyoming and Colorado. She was educated at Harvard University, St. Olaf College, and the University of Texas at Austin. Emily is a faculty member in the MFA program at Antioch University in Los Angeles, where she lives now. Uh, what do you teach in that program? I teach creative writing to graduate students, so nonfiction, fiction, poetry. How mm -hmm. hard is that? How hard is the job, or how hard do the students work? <laughs> Both. And how do you uh, teach it to you know adult students? Well, we have wonderful students, and <laughs> we do. And our program is designed for the non-traditional student, meaning that people who've had careers as actors or lawyers oh. or other careers often come back to our program and decide they want to be writers. So oh. they come with a whole lifetime of different stories, and we have a really diverse student body as well, which helps. And so, what do you do? You wh how do you draw these stories from all these different people, and how do with you with force? Edit it. <laughs> um, no, what we do is, you know, we have seminars for them about issues of craft. And the thing about writing is that oh. it can be taught, the craft of writing can be taught. And the most important thing for writers to learn is to just keep doing it and to work, to work hard. So people come with an idea of what they want to write about, and we help them shape the piece into something that they're proud of in the but, end. But what about their command of the English language or their command of writing English? Um, I mean, sentences a, yeah, and descriptions. Mm -hmm. It is a skill. It's a skill, and that can be taught. That skill can be taught. Oh, it can? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. That's why I have a job. <laughs> it better be. That's what I do. But then, what do you do? Do you rewrite sentences? How do no, you do it? No, we just, um, you know, we'll you know, mark a paragraph and say this needs to be rewritten. It doesn't make sense, or this is a cliche metaphor. Can you rewrite it? Um, do you teach structure. those? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Literary terms. Yes. Yes, we do. We do a lot of liter literary technique and craft. And then education. when they rewrite it, do, and you said you have to just keep writing, is that the crux of writing anything? The crux of writing is rewriting, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And writing and, and writing. rewriting and rewriting, yeah. You've, you've gotten a lot of um, awards and honors for your poetry, for your mm -hmm. fiction, for your nonfiction. Do you have to submit the work to get those awards? Um, sometimes. <coughs> and some, like the Rona Jaffe Award is a nomination, and it's actually a blind nomination. So, Does, in other so words, someone I don't know in? who put me up for that. I Thank you, whoever you were. <laughs> is that but, right? You yeah, would, do I, they read it on their own, the judges, and they then do, find you? Yes, they do, they do read it. And then when I was chosen for the Philip Roth Award, he actually chose my manuscript out of the ones that were submitted to him in a group. So, so you sent it in I to sent a group. it in to get a fellowship, and then they sent it off to him. And it depends. I mean, I still send submissions to uh, literary magazines at universities. Cities. But if it's a bigger magazine, then the men, my agent would do that. And then what? Oh, now, but you didn't have an agent at no, all I the did time. Not. No, so, no. so before <laughs> no, you not. were doing it yourself. Yeah, I was doing it myself. And, and now, that's a lot of work. It's, and what do you do? And when you write something, do you think it's good enough to to send it in? Um, usually no. <laughs> what would some person do if they wanted to have their work recognized? That's a good question. I think to to give it to someone they respect. Um, I have a group of, or a group, a two readers who read for me, and they are honest readers, and they're good readers, and so they tell me, you know, this isn't really ready, you should wait, you should change this, and then I send it off after I get their opinion. So those are just people you hire? No, oh, no, they're people I knew from graduate school. People who I developed relationships oh, so with they, while I was in school. So that's, that's right. not their job? No. Oh, I see. No, I don't pay them. No, and they I, don't pay me. <laughs> no, I just wondered, yeah. if, is there a, some kind of... Uh, position like that where someone could read your work? There is, but I think it's better for writers and that's what we try to do in my program is to cultivate oh. a community of people who will assist others in their work. Oh, I it's see. important I think, to have a community when you're working in I writing. I think that's great, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. if you're in a class together then you feel comfortable yeah. because you've all been criticized by the same person. Yes, me. A lot of, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of your writings come out of a biblical background yes. and your family background. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. My dad is a Lutheran pastor, still is, has been a pastor for almost 40 years, I think, 40 years. And so I grew up in a, in a traditional Lutheran household, but it wasn't like uh, in Footloose where no one could dance or drink or anything. It was very, very wonderful um, upbringing that I had, steeped in things like moral values and family traditions and religious ritual. And then, but, so. and then even though you were brought up in this background, you went on to study in a lot of I Bible did. courses and I did. different things in Dublin. What, tell us a little yeah, bit about that. Um, well, I always tell my students about the Bible is that if you really want a good story, read the Bible because there's everything in there. There's adultery, there's lust, there's people being smited, there's you know plagues, there's all kinds of drama, subtext and dialogue. 
And so I've always been really interested in Bible stories in the way that they are prototypes for the stories we tell today. So in, in Dublin, for example, I did Hebrew and Biblical studies as an exchange student. So that's what I was doing So there. you studied Hebrew? I don't know how much I studied. I, I, I mean, studied, maybe is a loose term for what I did in Dublin, but I did, I was in the Hebrew and Biblical studies department. So, But, but it, was that to study how to speak Hebrew? No, or it was the Biblical studies? Hebrew. Biblical I see, Hebrew, I that's see, right, I see. to read Biblical Hebrew. But those were all precursors to your memoir, yes. Poster Child. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about how Poster Child came about. Okay. Um, I wrote uh, an essay when I was uh. in graduate school about growing up with a disability. I have an artificial leg, and I had been writing some really bad stories about disabled characters, and they were so bad. And I thought, you know, maybe I should write about my own experience. And I tried that, and I workshopped it in front of uh, like 25 people. and. I was mortified, I was so terrified, and it was such a great experience, I got such good feedback, and I thought, you know what, this is the book I'm going to write first, I'm going to make art out of this experience. Why were they so bad, the way oh. you explained them? I mean, because your book is wrenching to read, I mm -hmm. think it's really difficult to yeah. read, and that's what you wanted, I guess. Well, I want people <laughs> to have an emotional experience. I did, and it was so, honest. Yeah, and to be honest, I think because when I was writing fiction with people with disabilities as characters, I was too removed from the situation. And but so you now I'm speaking the, in the eye voice. Yeah, but you had the situation, so how could you be removed? Well, I think when you write fiction, there's a, another level of distance you have to establish in order to make contact with a character that's not you. And you have to do the same similar thing in me writing memoir even, but I think it's different in fiction. When, when I started reading, I wondered if there were other books like this, and I think there are other books there's some, like yours, yeah. and uh, what were they, and how did they address these issues? Well, I think most, actually most books about people with disabilities fall into two categories. There's the pity category, which is like, oh, my miserable life, and then there's the sort of super achieving category that's usually saved for people who do things like sports or are sports oh, right. stars. There's uh -huh. not a lot in between those, those, two level, those two ends of the spectrum. So I was hoping that this book would offer an honest experience that would appeal to people who don't just have disabilities because the issues, things like body acceptance, the quest for perfection, those are universal themes and they're especially you know, acute for women in this, in this culture particularly. Um, so. You were born with a congenital defect. defect. Right. Mm -hmm. And if that happened today, would they amputate your leg? They would still, yes. They still would? They still would. So tell us a little bit about that because you had to learn all about this, but you didn't yeah. get you didn't get to learn about it till you were already <laughs> yeah. grown up. Well, I didn't want to know about it when I was growing up. I was just like I didn't want to talk about the leg. I didn't want to think about it, which is documented in the book. Sort of the the tyranny of adolescence, where you just like but, I just want to be like everybody else, you know. But so you always you, you had a wooden leg when you yeah, started I did. walking. Yeah, so uncool. Yeah, especially as a teenager, <laughs> it was just like just morbidly uncool. Um, yeah, I've always walked with an artificial leg or brace. It's the only body I've ever known, and so that actually is an advantage in many ways, as you can imagine. I did learn a lot about my defect, which is called proximal focal femoral deficiency, which is in it? real language just means that one leg is shorter than the other and can't be corrected in any other way besides amputation. Does it happen a lot? It doesn't happen a lot, although I have a really close friend who's my age and has a, sim a similar defect, and I have met people through the process of writing this book and going on book tour who have the same defect. So one of the things that you had to le learn about, and I think this whole chapter, is um, limb technology. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's really interesting. It is really interesting. Especially, for me, it was a struggle because I can't even like program my iPod. So I was like, how am I going to learn about mechanical knees and you know computerized knees? But it is amazing. I mean, an important thing to note, though, is it's off limits for many, many people with disabilities because it's just so expensive. I mean, so oh, much of these technological so advances are just really expensive. So is that what, what the athletes would get? They would, right. And a lot of the athletes get, um, they get given legs, in other words. So gifts. that you can yes, use, yeah. so you can show. Test it or something. Test it, yeah. I see. I see. So. So, so you wrote the book so that it would be kind of in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, and I hoped it would be a piece of art. You know, I wanted to make art out of my experience. So I wanted it to be beautifully, beautiful to read and beautiful language. And, and as you as you were writing and as you were growing up, you you got a Fulbright. I did. And you went to Korea. Oh, Yay. I did. I went to Korea. But that was a, seemed like a very painful experience. It was, it was one of those things where it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. So I, tell us about it. I went to Korea. I was 21, and I had never really dealt with having a disability in a very real way. And I got there and I couldn't speak the language. Um. I felt totally out of place and I just I just decided I just had a kind of a meltdown in other words. 
And I thought, you know what, I've got to get a handle on these, these issues. So I flew home, and that's when I first started thinking about writing this book. I was like, what happened to me over there? Like, I really had, there's a dissonance between how I feel about myself and how I present myself in the world. Tell us something. Tell us one of those situations when you fell down. Right, so because when I got to Korea. Yeah. Is, you can read it in the book, but I think it's, I'd like to hear yeah, it from sure. your mouth. So when I got to Korea, it was the summer, and it's very hot and humid in, in South Korea in the summer, and I had a hydraulic prosthesis, which I did not take care of. I just like would throw it in a bag and throw it off at night, and I was just like, whatever. Well, the hydraulics were heat sensitive, and it was so hot, and I was walking around <laughs> trying to find my way, and it just like, like the liquid just exploded, or something happened, I don't know. And it fell apart. So I literally your leg fell. fell apart? Well, it didn't like fall into pieces, but, but I, mean, I fell down. Uh huh. And in a puddle of oil, of course, wearing a white dress, of course. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, and I, I just felt like, what am I going to do? And I had to, this, there was a man selling um, sort of a collection of items in a little stand, and I was just like, help, you know, sort of s s sat there, and he came out and helped me, and he found a little Allen wrench, and he tightened the hydraulics. Did, such did an he amazing. See your leg? Oh, yeah, he was like running out and helping me, and he was wonderful. I mean, so he tightened it. Yeah, he, he wasn't found afraid. <laughs> no, he wasn't afraid. I mean, I think I was, he could tell I was, I needed help. So. I think that's the problem. I think it's the public yeah. treating you in a different way. Of course, yeah. Of course. But we get, you get used to that. If, you, you if you're different at all, you get used to that. And, and before we leave, I think the idea that you got so used to yourself, and as you got older, you wanted to be sexy. Yeah. And this you address also in yes. the book. Yes, yes. I do, and I, that's been one of the most satisfying res uh, set of responses I've gotten from other women with ampu or amputations who are like, I feel like this is a, a guide to dating or something like that, or just, you know, it's, I have to, you have to come to terms with myself and other people aren't going to care, and I think that's a really important message to send because, you know, we all have things about us that we don't necessarily love or like, and it doesn't make us unlovable, so it's an important thing to remember. That, and, and then... You say you can read the past by your pile of old legs, outgrown oh, yeah. legs, because legs. you don't think about outgrowing. You're a very tall girl. Yeah, now I'm tall. And yeah, it's fun to watch them all lined up on the wall, sort of these little wooden legs that get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden they become like technologically advanced like when I was in, in college. Do you have them all? I do. My parents have them. Yeah, they have them in a box. So, I know, isn't that funny? And my mom, my mom likes to get them out. And when I was doing research for the book, it was really interesting to look at them because they had stains. Or there would be like a, like a hole once my brother whacked me with a croquet mallet. And there was like a big hole. And she's like, remember that? You know, I fell out of a tree in one of them. And you can see like there's a little grass stain on the side. I mean, it's very interesting to have these like physical touchstones of your history right in front of you. It's pretty amazing. So now I see why you wrote the book. I yeah. think it's a really Thank good, you. it was good for you probably, yeah, and it's it was. good for other people. It's pe I hope so. for people who don't have those problems. Exactly. Yeah. And to understand. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. Bye. <laughs>